scripture lesson today is taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, 12 through 16. Hebrews 4, 12 through 16. Hebrews 4, 12 through 16. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto his eyes. All him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we, as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to get help in time of need. Thus endeth the reading of God's holy word, may bless his truth into our hearts. And let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity of service in your name today. We thank you for the opportunity of being in your house and with your people. And we thank you, God, that you're here with us today because we remember your words when you said where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. And for that, we're grateful. Father, we thank you for the beautiful weather we've been having. We thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the rain. We thank you for all that you do for us day in and day out. Father, we ask your blessing upon each one here today. And we ask a special blessing upon those that would like to be here and are not. And those that have special, special needs. We ask our Father that you bless Tyler White. Olivia McPeak and Michael Leggett, we ask your healing hand upon them and lift them up, our Father, as they do service and for the common man, they also do service in your name. Father, we just pray for Pat. We ask that you remove the pain from her and we pray, our Father, that you'll have a good report when she goes for her scan. We pray for Myra and we just pray that her test will come out very good. We pray for Faye and we ask your comforting hand be upon her and take care of her. We pray for Sue and we thank you, Father, for keeping her going this long. We pray that you will bless her and heal her and, and give her many more years. Father, we pray for Teresa and we ask your healing hand upon her. We pray for Tammy Long and we, faith, we pray our Father for healing. We pray for Shirley Ambrose and we pray that they'll find out the reason for her cough and be able to heal her. Father, we pray for the schools, that should, not just here but all over the country, where they know that uh, they go in there, they have a good chance of, of uh, getting it something that they don't need to have. And we just pray our Father you be with them. We thank you, Father, for the good report that J.R. got. And we ask that you would continue to lift him up and care for him. We pray for unanswered prayers. We pray for air pray, we pray for the prayers that we need and Father, you know our needs even before we have them. So we ask you to pray our Father to touch the ones that need a special blessing from unspoken prayer. 
bless them up for it because you know the needs. Uh, I ask prayer for my great granddaughter, Catherine D. And we pray that she will get a good report of Cleveland. Everything will be okay. Bless her, our Father. We pray for myself as I go in for a test this week. We pray that it will be good. That Father, whatever happens, it's in your hands. And I just trust you for everything. Father, we thank you for this great nation we live in. We pray that you will help each of us do our part to turn it back to one nation under God. We thank you for our military, especially those in harm's way. We pray that you will keep them safe and keep them strong, that they will be able to protect us and keep us free, that we will be able to worship thee openly as we are today. Father, we ask your blessing upon Sharon as she cares for her mother. And we, we pray for Patty. And we ask your healing hand upon her. And we pray for Delma to be with him and lift him up. Father, we just bow humbly in thy presence for we realize how weak we are and we realize how strong you are. And Father, we pray that we might draw from your strength for all these people as we mentioned today and for each one in this room. Be with us now, our Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be accepted today, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. I had a joke that's going to tell it, I better not. Time's running out. It's not unusual for people to visualize Christ, to see him as being like themselves. The extreme of this is probably Van Gogh's painting, which he called Pita, P I E T A. It is a painting of Jesus and his mother. The unique characteristics of that picture is that Jesus has red hair. Now obviously, it is highly, highly doubtful that Jesus had red hair. Very few people living in that part of the world do. But Van Gogh had red hair, and that is how he saw Jesus. There is that natural tendency to paint Christ in our own image. Yet for most of us, that's not enough. There are times when our hearts also hunger to behold Christ high and lift him up in his majesty and in his glory. We long to cry out to him as John did, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Our text for today allows us to see Christ in both roles. We see him as one who emptied himself and became as we are, and at the same time, we see him as much, much more. We see him as our great high priest. Since then, we have a great high priest, the writer of Hebrews tells us, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. That is the Christ we would see this morning. The Christ who is like us, but is also our mediator and our redeemer, who sits on the right hand of the Father. Notice, first of all, that Christ has walked where we walk. We read, For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet without sin. A few months ago, the eyes of our country were upon Gallaudet, University in Washington, D.C. 
when the president of that school had been defied by the students. Now that hasn't been usual in our society over the past two decades, but this president was finally disposed of for a very unusual reason. She was not deaf. And Gallup University serves 21,025 deaf students. So it's interesting to read about the first meeting between King Jordan, the 44-year-old new president, who was chosen in the aftermath of the controversy, the student body president, and the new chairman of the board of trustees. They met to talk about the future of the school. When they came out of the meeting, the president of the student, student body turned to the new president of the university and said with tears in his eyes, there was no interpreter. And that was true because the new president, King Jordan, his death as a student, he was chosen to serve. You can appreciate the need of these young people to have someone leaving them who is like them and can share their struggle. After World War II, the people of Genoa, Italy, commissioned an eight-ton statue of Jesus Christ. Once it was finished, it was not put on a hilltop as most of them were, but it was lowered into the depths of the Bay of Genoa, where a great naval battle had taken place during the Second World War, and where many ships were sunk. It was a sight where many sailors gave their lives to symbolize of Christ being lowered into the deep where the bodies of those brave men rest is powerful and profound. <coughs> the statue is called Christ of the Deep. It represents what Christ has done in our behalf. He empties himself and became as we are. Another example of the Christian faith is growing today in Korea faster than any other place in the world. Many people have speculated as to why Christianity is growing so fast in an unlikely Asian land. One reason may be that the Buddhist and the Confucian religions once were dominant in Korea. Both put their emphasis upon religion as mystical and speculative and remote. The Christian faith came to Korea with a message of involvement, a message of love, a message of compassion. The Christians started right from the beginning feeding the starving, sheltering the homeless, and teaching the illiterate. The Korean people were receptive to that kind of self-giving religion. So the Christian community is growing by leaps and bounds in Korea today. The Korean church, of course, is simply being the self-giving body of Jesus Christ. He walked where we walk, and he fought the battle that we now fight. Christ came into a sin-plagued world, a sin-infected world. Never has there been a human being who has escaped a struggle with his or her lower nature. No matter how disciplined and how, how well intentioned we may be to sin, sin is part and partial to the human relationship. 
between us and the Father God. I heard about a pastor who was being honored for his congregation for his humility. They presented him with a medal. And unfortunately, after a while, they had to take it back because he put it on and wore it every day and thereby revealed that he just wasn't as humble as they thought he was. We live in a tainted world and none of us escapes it. Stephen Leacock wrote a brilliant humorous piece about a young pastor named Mel Plunk and us, Jones. This young pastor was honest. And he was honest to a timid sort of way. He couldn't even bring himself to tell a little white lie that are part and partial to the normal etiquette of society. For example, on his first pastoral call, he got along fine at first. He sat down, talked with the lady of the house, and drank some tea. He leafed through the family photograph album, and he chatted pleasantly. After about an hour, he stood up to leave, and he said, well, I must really go now. And the hostess, being very polite, said, Oh, must you go so soon? Well, being totally honest, he had to admit that he really didn't have anything else to do at that particular moment. He didn't have any place to go. So he sat back down. As the afternoon progressed, they went through this ritual several times. He would say he had to go, and she would say, Really? Must you go? And he would respond, well, no, I really don't have to. After all, he began his vacation that next day. There was nothing really pressing. Finally, the husband came home. And it was late in the evening. And the husband, with a tinge of sarcasm in his voice, said to the pastor, well, couldn't you just stay all night? And the young pastor said, well, there wasn't any reason why he couldn't, so he did. And then he stayed the next day and several days afterwards. He had leafed through the photograph album till his fingers were sore, and even worse, he was bloated from drinking so much tea. Finally, he was so filled with tea and with boredom that he became physically ill. And his condition really deteriorated fast. With a sigh, he said to the host, Now I must really be going. And he died. Well, he was honest. But this is a world that isn't ready for that kind of honesty. We live in a sin inflected world. And into this world came one who was tempted in every respect as we are. He walked where we walk, and he fought the battle that we must fight. But there's even more. He revealed for all to see the gracious love of the Father. That is a blessed good news of the atonement. On the cross we see the lengths to which God would go to free his children from the power of sin and death. Charles Turkington tells about seeing a classified ad in the newspaper during, uh, back during the 1960s, the time when a lot of young people were running away from home joining communes, driving around in Volkswagen buses, having all kinds of trouble. The ad was placed by the father of a teenage son. 
who had run away from home and used what they had said. Sheldon, come home. Stop chasing flowers and hippies. True values can be found only at home. When you're ready to come back, please let me know as we already run it out your room. Papa. <laughs> Somehow that doesn't come across to me as unconditional grace. Karl Barth was once asked what he would say if he met Adolf Hitler. And the great theologian responded, I would say to him that Jesus Christ died for his sins. This is not to make light of sin or our responsibility to sin. It is to say we have one who sympathizes with us in our sin. Who understands our weaknesses and who is able to forgive us of all our trespasses. There's a story that's told about two little boys who were out in the yard playing and, and they eventually got into a fight as little boys often do. And one of them yelled at the other one, I'll never speak to you again. And he left, they both went home. Well, the next day they were back out playing in the yard as if nothing had happened. And one of the little boy's mother asked him, You're speaking now? I thought you said you was never going to speak to each other again. And he responded, Me and Johnny are good forgetters. Amen. And you know that God is a good forgiver. Christ has experienced what it is to be human and he has conquered sin. He has made it possible for us to experience God's love and God's forgiveness. He has walked where we walk. He has fought the battle that we fight. He has revealed the Father's love for us. And finally, he enables us to approach God with a holy boldness. A boldness that comes not because of who we are or what we have done, but because of who he is and what he has done. We have a high priest before the throne of God the writer of Hebrews ends his chapter with these words. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's a beautiful Greek word that is used in Hebrews 6.20. There the writer of Hebrews calls Jesus our front runner. In those days there were heavy ships coming into the harbor and when they came in they sent in first a smaller ship to lead them away. The smaller ship would check the depth of the water, the amount of current was flowing and where the rocks were and then the heavy ships would come in. All the hidden dangers would be revealed so that the ships could come in safely. That little boat was the prod prodromus. I don't know much about Greek. P R O D R O M O S. Prodromus. The guide. The front row. That is the word Hebrews uses to describe Jesus. He is the one who has gone before us, scouting the way. He is the one that leads us safely into the harbor. This was 
brought home to me in a beautiful way that Scott Walker had in his book entitled Life Rails. He tells a true story of James Pearson, a friend of his who was a soldier during the Second World War. Pearson was in charge of reconnaissance and he was sent out to survey the enemy line. On one particular mission, they had to cross an American minefield before they could get over into the German territory. Fortunately, the mines were well marked for the American soldiers. So very carefully, they made their way through the booby-trapped train. Just as they were safely across the field and nearly to the German lines, a machine gunner saw them and pinned them down with fire. There they were, a whole platoon of reconnaissance soldiers stopped dead in their tracks. As time passed, they realized that their position was precarious. The German army would be advancing soon and they decided that the only thing they could do was be retreat. And that meant going back across that minefield. In the meantime, while they were pinned down, snow had been falling because this was in the middle of the winter. And by the time the decision was made to forsake their mission and start back, enough snow had fallen that it covered up the markers that showed them where the mines were. The lieutenant, thinking very quickly, drew his men together and gave them this order. I will go first across the field. You are to follow 30 yards apart. In that way, you are to walk in my footsteps. That way, if I hit a mine, I alone will be killed. That was their word. 30 yards distance between the men, walking exactly in the footprints of their leader. To make a long story short, miraculously, they made it across the minefield back to safety. As one surveyed that line of footprints, it looked as if only one person had made that journey. They had followed exactly in the steps of their lieutenant. Later, some engineers came to remark and to replace the marks where the mines were. And they discovered by gazing at the footprints in the snow that on one occasion, the soldiers had stepped right across a mine. They had just barely missed setting it off. But they all got back safely because they followed in the footsteps of <coughs> their leader. Is that not our hope as well? Yes. This is more than saying that Jesus is our example. He is that. But far more. He is our great high <laughs> priest. He is our front runner, one who has already passed through the heavens and now mediates on our behalf before the throne of God so that we might come confidently before God, that walking in His steps we might receive mercy and find grace and help in a time of need. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your son who came and lived as we live, that he was tempted as we we're tempted, but he was without sin. And Father, he came to take away our sins because we're not as diligent as him. And Father, we ask you to forgive us our sins, our many sins and bless us with your greatness. Father, we look to you for our strength and guidance. And when we come through those tough decisions, we 
pray that we will always make them in your favor. When we come to those crossroads of life, help us to pick the right way that will lead into your heavenly kingdom. We thank you for the blessings that you have given to us. And we thank you once again for your Son who came and lived and died that we might have life and life eternal. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen.